This fungus covers more land than all of Earth's tropical rainforest combined. Covering up to 8% of the Earth's surface area, it is seen absolutely everywhere. Covering natural structures like trees and rocks, to man-made structures like roofs and road signs. Now, the fungus in question is called lichen. But what is lichen? Why is it everywhere? To answer these questions, we have to ask how much atmospheric pressure is at the bottom of the deepest place on Earth. Simply put, lichen are organisms comprising of multiple partners, some algae, some fungi, some cyanobacteria, merging and evolving together to create one single organism. But more on that later. For now, we need to know where it all started. We don't know when lichen first evolved to become lichen, but we do know the earliest fossil discovered dates from over 400 million years ago, the same time period that vertebrates started walking on land. When I first found out people dedicated their lives to studying lichen, I could not stop laughing. But then I wondered, what if they're up to something? And they were. German geographer Alexander von Humboldt came up with the concept that nature is interconnected, being a system of active forces. This led him to conclude that all organisms, from mushroom to elephant, cannot be understood in isolation, and that we need to study the relationship the species has with other organisms around it. And it's true. Decades later, in the year 1867, botanist Simon Swendener came up with the dual hypothesis of lichens, concluding that lichens was not a single organism, but in fact had multiple partners, some fungi, some algae, some cyanobacteria, merging and evolving together to form something with such great complexity. The term used to describe this relationship is called symbiosis, but lichen is not just a mix of any random species. No, instead, the relationship lichens has is called an inter-kingdom relationship, a relationship between at least two species from at least two or more separate kingdoms as seen in the Tree of Life. If we actually look closer at the Tree of Life, we can see the common ancestor between animals and fungi splits later than its common ancestor split with plants. In simpler terms, that means fungi is more closely related to every animal ever, including humans, than they are to plants the very thing fungus has evolved a relationship with to form lichen. In fact, it's this very relationship that causes them to be so bright in colour, as the algal or cyanobacterial partner can vary in colours, ranging from bright yellows to lime greens and everything in between. In this relationship, the fungal partner, also known as the mycobiont, offers physical protection and acquired nutrients, whereas the algal partner, being the photobiont, plays its role by performing the act of photosynthesis, where it takes in carbon dioxide, water and sunlight to create sugars, energy and oxygen. Quick message and please watch to the end it's very important now you might have been wondering why this video is a fundraiser well recently i've been hired by the anti-poaching organization vetpaw to monitor the increase in the brown hyena population in their south african game reserve now although this sounds really cool i need to fundraise 108 camera traps which totals up to around 17 and a quarter thousand pounds and i'm gonna be honest i don't have that kind of money so i really need your help firstly if you subscribe to this channel right now i will donate 10 pence of my own money towards these camera traps so so please share it to everyone you know. Share it on your Instagram story, share it to your friends, your family, your boss, anyone. So then they can subscribe too, so I could end up flat out broke, all in the name for conservation. Secondly, this one's on topic of the video. So since you've made it this far through the video, you must be somewhat interested in lichen. Well, lucky for you, most of the information I got from this video is actually from the book Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. So I've got an affiliate link in the first link in the description where you can buy this book and a cut of the money will go towards me. Now, all of that money is going to go straight towards the camera trap so I'm not profiting off this at all. Now this book is honestly one of the best books I've read this year and it covers topics like lichen way deeper than I have in this video in addition to loads of other mycology topics like psychedelics or mycorrhizal networks. Third and finally if you're feeling generous you can go to my GoFundMe page in the second link in the description and donate as much money as you want. All money will be much appreciated so thank you for watching and back to the lichen. So why is lichen everywhere? Now, the better way to ask this question is by instead asking how is lichen everywhere? How is lichen everywhere? Here's one for you. Even in the hottest, driest parts of the world's deserts, lichens thrive as crusts on the scorched ground. Lichen doesn't just hang tight and hope to survive this extreme environment. No, instead they actually play a crucial role here, stabilising the desert's sandy surface, acting as almost like a blanket for the sand, holding the sand particles together, preventing them from being easily blown away by the wind, which, as you can imagine, prevents dust storms and further desertification. Right, that covers extreme temperature, but what about other extremes, like pressure? Well, in 
2007. Lichen researchers showed they survived shockwaves with a pressure of 10 to 50 gigapascals. Yeah, I had no idea what that meant either. But for context, that's 100 to 500 times greater than the pressure at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest place on Earth. Now, that is an extreme environment for what's below, but what about extreme environments for what's above? You guessed it, you can literally send lichen into the vacuum of space, in which they'll go through immense amounts of UV radiation and temperature swings. But when you send them back down to Earth to rehydrate, they'll spring back into action and continue on with their life. How mad is that? So, when we ask the question, how is lichen everywhere, it all comes down to them being poly extremophiles, which means they can survive multiple types of extreme environments, like extreme temperature, pressure, and even space. So, this allows them to not only survive, but thrive in the most toughest places in and beyond Earth. So, no wonder why they're everywhere. But don't be fooled, because lichen can eventually die. And when it does, similar to coral, the relationship falls, and you're left with a sad grey fungus. Away from its algal partner, it requires for survival. But if lichen are poly extremophiles and can survive everywhere, why don't we see them that often in big cities? Well, despite being able to live in space and deserts, lichen seem to be sensitive to a couple things, one of which is air pollution. So, urban areas with high pollution rates aren't exactly their habitat of choice. In fact, lichen is so sensitive to air pollution, researchers are now using them as an indicator species, where they're used in scientific studies to see how polluted an area is, comparing lichen communities in varying pollution levels to assess the impact air pollution is having on both wildlife and human health. Because, let's not forget, air pollution affects us too. So, maybe we have more in common of lichen than you might have thought. Pfft, me? Similar to lichen? I don't think so. Lichen's comprised of multiple organisms and I'm all human. Well, you're not. In fact, as you watch this video, you have literally trillions of microorganisms living in and around your body. But don't worry, because these microorganisms, like gut bacteria, are not only essential for your survival, but are also a piece of the puzzle of what makes you, you. So we also have an interkingdom relationship with bacteria and other various microorganisms. And that's just the start. The development in artificial intelligence has been substantial. And with the release of things like ChatGPT, it's clear it's being developed more and more every Every day. So maybe we'll develop a close relationship with technology, so much so that we'll become dependent on one another. Not creating an inter-kingdom relationship, but rather an inter-biotechnological relationship. Creating what we know now as cyborgs. Eh, probably not.